evening, all, and, and, and uh, uh, welcome to our discussion of the future of reproductive rights and the importance of bar engagement. Uh, I, I feel like I'm in a, in, on a ship that is listing to port. If, uh, if p other people come in, they may want to fill some of the seats on this side of the room. You might leave the impression that this is otherwise a left-leaning uh, uh, gathering. <laughs> uh, uh, it's just a, a, a pleasure to have you all here. My name is John Kiernan. I'm president of the City Bar Association. And uh, we're particularly glad uh, this evening to be welcoming the uh, Center for, for Reproductive Rights and its uh, a dynamic force of nature, President and CEO Nancy Northup, to talk about uh, the lawyers' network with you. And, uh, and delighted to be presenting this all-star panel discussion uh, among New York's Attorney General Eric Schneiderman, uh, Professor Melissa Murray, moderated by Dahlia Litwick of Slate Magazine. Uh, we're grateful to the co-sponsors of this event, along with the Center for Reproductive Rights, uh, the City Bar's Sex and the Law Committee, uh, chaired by Mira Kurzer and Melissa Lee, and the City Bar's uh, uh, Pro Bono and Legal Services Committee, chaired by uh, Allison King and Amy Barish. Um, the City Bar uh, is particularly happy to be hosting this event uh, because we're ourselves proud of our longtime engagement in support of reproductive rights, uh, going uh, all the way back, I suppose, to our establishment of the uh, Sex and the Law Committee in uh, 1971, uh, adding as one of our very earliest members uh, to, of that committee, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who's gone on to have some impact in that area uh, afterwards. Uh, uh, over the decades, uh, as a bar association, uh, we've uh, opposed uh, restrictive federal legislation and regulation on many occasions, have authored and submitted uh, numerous amicus briefs and important reproductive rights issues, uh, uh, including in the last year uh, in the Whole Women's Health, the Vihelistat case that we'll be talking about a little bit this evening, and in another case uh, involving uh, a woman's a pregnant woman's suit against a hospital for performing operative procedures against her will. Uh, we've issued reports and memos over the years in support of New York's reproductive uh, uh, Health Act and the Comprehensive uh, uh, Contraceptive Coverage Act. We've advocated for over-the-counter status for oral contraceptives, have urged the city to prov provide meaningful protection uh, to abortion clinic buffer zones, and have supported uh, state legislation requiring uh, military health care coverage for abortions in cases of rape or incest. Uh, now, as we all know, uh, uh, now is obviously an apt time uh, for tonight's discussion to be taking place. Uh, buffer zones, funding, regulatory restrictions, and the assault on parent, Planned Parenthood are all very much alive and active parts of the current dialogue. If a constitutional convention proceeds here in New York after the, the vote on whether one will take place in November, uh, efforts to enshrine important reproductive rights provisions in the New York State Constitution as an, in, in an effort to insulate New York State against a risk of uh, changes in point of view uh, from the federal executive legislature or the Supreme Court uh, seem likely to be part of the dialogue at that convention. And even if a convention doesn't take place, uh, 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 the current uh, political environment provides lots of reasons to view the state of reproductive rights uh, in this state and, this, and in this country as likely to remain unsettled and subject to substantial debate uh, for the immediate future. Uh, there is, as Nancy uh, will explain, lots for lawyers and bar associations to do uh, to protect reproductive rights uh, in these circumstances and this environment. And it's a pleasure for us to work with uh, the great individuals and enterprises gathered here uh, this evening in that effort. Uh, Nancy Northup, the president and CEO of the Center for Reproductive Rights, is the right person uh, to present a call to action for all of us. It's a pleasure to welcome her to say a few words now. Nancy.
Uh, thank you, John, and good evening, everyone. It's really great to see you here tonight, and I hope that you will stay after the lively uh, panel that we're going to have for food and beverage uh, in the adjoining room. So tonight, we're going to be talking about, as you heard, the state of current environment on politics, on reproductive rights uh, in the U.S., and the impact that has on women's health. And I'm going to tell you about the new lawyers network that the Center for Reproductive Rights is launching to educate and engage the legal profession around this critical fight that we're in. But first, I want to take us back to some fundamentals. There is so much politics around reproductive rights that we forget that at the heart of the matter are some key biological and medical facts. Now, there are also social and cultural and economic and other factors as well that form the basis for why reproductive rights are fundamental rights. But I just want to focus us all, before we get into the politics and the law and all that, on some of those basic biological and medical facts. So uh, here's one fact. Women and men have different reproductive systems. OK? That's a fact. Fact, women risk their lives and their health to birth children, and men do not. So think about that. Again, there's so much politics, so much fighting, so much partisanship that we forget these basic facts. Now, for men to contribute to the birth of a child, they need to contribute sperm. That's it. And I'm told it's not a very painful process. <laughs> for women to give birth to a child, they need to contribute uh, an egg which may or may not be a painful process, depending on the woman, depending on whether there has to be assisted reproductive technology. Then, for nine months, she needs to be the gestational carrier for first an embryo, and then a fetus, and eventually a baby. And every step of those nine months, there are huge physiological and biological and hormonal changes and risks to women's health and life. And then, at the end of nine months, if she's able to carry fully to term, she needs to deliver that baby either through the birthing process or through surgery, and again, with risks to women's life and health. So that fundamental fact tells you why women's ability to be able to control the number and spacing of her children, whether and when she wants to have children, how many children, those facts alone lead to why it's a fundamental right for women, it's fundamental to their very right to life, as well as to their health. And other things that will come into play later, equality and dignity and the ability to make decisions. Now, it's also a fact, as I've just said, that the women's capacity to reproduce has enormous impl implications for her health. Without access to prenatal care and life-saving obstetrics care, women can die. And that has been true throughout history, it's true today. If you look around the world, in countries that are still developing in their health systems, for example, in Nigeria, a woman's lifetime risk of dying in connection with pregnancy is one in 20. So if you are a woman in Nigeria, you are very likely to fear death through pregnancy. One in 20 in Nigeria. In Italy, it's one in 20,000. There is nothing different biologically about women in Italy than women in Nigeria. What is different is whether they have access to health care. And again, why is reproductive health care so essential to women? Because of those numbers. One in 20, one in 20,000. Without access to contraception, the average sexually active heterosexual woman would have 10 children. She would go through that process that we just talked about with those risks to health and life, perhaps 10 times. And that is why access to contraception is so fundamental to women's health and lives. And the ability to access safe and legal abortion. Because in this country, before Roe versus Wade and throughout the world, if women cannot access safe and legal abortion, women will die. So as I said, it's not just these rights that refer to women's right to life and their right to health, but also to her right to autonomy, dignity, equality are implicated. And 
it is based on all these things that courts here in the US, courts in other constitutional systems around the world, and international human rights bodies have found that reproductive rights are fundamental human rights. But as everybody in this room knows, it remains a contested issue in the United States. And that brings us to the need for bar engagement. We're still fighting here in the United States about access to safe and legal abortion. We're still fighting about whether contraception is preventative medicine that women should be able to access and have covered by their health insurance. And for heaven's sakes, we're still fighting about whether obstetrics care needs to be covered as a fundamental package in health insurance. So when we think about bar engagement, I want us to take you back to June of 2016 when the Center for Reproductive Rights won the Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstadt case in the Supreme Court. There was tremendous engagement by the bar in that case. And even if we just think about this room, we can see it right here. The New York City Bar Association, as you heard from John, filed a very important amicus brief in the case, which talked about how the US Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit case had come up from Texas, was abdicating its responsibility to have an affirmative duty to review the legislative findings. Attorney General Schneiderman, on behalf of 15 states and the District of Columbia, filed an incredibly important brief as well, which took a stand not usually taken by states who are in the business of defending legislative judgments, but again, talking about the need for there to be independent review of legislative overreach. Professor Melissa Murray, who you will hear from tonight, was the lead author of a brief of constitutional scholars that, among other things, talked about how Texas's abortion restrictions undermined women's dignity and stature as equal citizens. And more than 100 women attorneys signed on to a brief in their own names and with their professional affiliations where they talked to the Supreme Court about the fact that they had had abortions. And they brought that to the court's attention to let the court know that that language that the court has used in the past in abortion cases, talking about how essential the ability to control one's reproductive health is for women in terms of their participation equally in the, quote, economic and social life of the nation, that for these women who told their stories to the court, they said it was true of their lives. And they said they wanted to be sure that the right was protected for the next generation. All in all, there were 45 amicus briefs in the case, and 27 of them were authored by top law firms across the nation, bringing to bear different clients with different perspectives, but supporting the plaintiffs in Whole Women's Health. And I like to point out that not one major law firm across the country came in in support of Texas with an amicus brief. Now, as with the fight for civil rights, as for the fight for LGBTQ rights, lawyers play a critical role in the protection of reproductive rights, but we can do even more. And I'm not talking tonight, and this Lawyers Network is not just about pro bono support for cases or even just amicus briefs filed in cases. It's about the dialogue that we all need to be having. It's about raising the salience of reproductive rights issues, which are not just abortion rights. It's about obstetrics care. It's about health insurance coverage. It's about the emerging field of assisted reproductive technology. But all of these issues need to be educated, and we need to bring more people into the discussion within the bar. Because while it's clear that these basic principles are enshrined in federal and state law, there is much to be done to ensure that the full force of the law protects these rights in both theory and practice. So in terms of this fundamental education, what can you be doing? Well, bar associations and their leaders can influence their peers in law firms, corporate legal departments, government agencies, and even on the bench. We want to have a lot more programs like this, and they shouldn't just be coming out of the Women in Law Committee or the Sex in Law Committee. They should be coming out the many, many different committees where our issues <coughs> touch upon. Substantive programs and articles, writing, engagement, draft resolutions and policies for associations to support reproductive rights, and of course, assistance with amicus briefs and position statements. And I would encourage you not just to think about what you can do here in New York, but what you can do in engaging with your colleagues across the nation 
you know, your law school classmate who's practicing in Louisiana or Texas or Mississippi or Georgia or Florida or one of the many states where we have hard-fought battles. We are launching this Lawyers Network around the country. Call them up. Find out how they might want to be engaged. We need leaders in those states to take on these issues of reproductive health and rights in even those very tough environments. So I just want to introduce a couple of people in the audience tonight who are going to be important to this effort. We have a commission structure set up for the Lawyers Network, and we have three of our commissioners here tonight. So I want to ask Molly Rowe, Michelle Gallardo, and Bill Ferreira to please stand up. So feel free to talk to them about this effort during the reception afterwards. I also want to introduce Araceli Munoz from the Center for Reproductive Rights, who runs the, uh, the Lawyers Network for us, and she also will be available to talk to you. And finally, to also introduce Lourdes Rivera, who is the Senior Vice President of U.S. Programs in the U.S. Knows lots. Please talk to Lourdes. So join us. Reach out to your legal colleagues across the nation. And let's work together to create the programs and articles and policies to make reproductive rights truly a right protected fundamentally in this country. It is now my pleasure to introduce the evening's panel moderator, when we considered who would be ideal to guide a discussion on the state of reproductive rights today, Dahlia Lithwick was at the top of the list. She has been a consistent voice across a range of media on the role and impact of courts on a huge swath of constitutional issues, but including reproductive rights. She brings a keen understanding of the law from her education at Stanford Law School, where she received her JD before clerking on the US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. But she went on to become a prolific writer and journalist. She brings her strong voice to bear as the senior editor and legal correspondent at Slate Magazine, where she covers legal issues in two columns, Supreme Court Dispatches and Jurisprudence. And if reading Dahlia Lithwick is not enough for you, you can also hear her voice on her podcast, Amicus, which she's hosted since 2014. In addition to Slate, her work has appeared in the New York Times, Harper's, The New Yorker, The Washington Post, and she won the 2013 National Magazine Award for her columns on the Affordable Care Act. She has published extensively on reproductive rights in the Supreme Court's 2016 decision on whole women's health, so I know she'll be helping to set up that conversation tonight. For all these reasons, she's a go-to resource on reproductive rights. You've probably seen her both on uh, networks and on cable television shows. We're thrilled to have her with you tonight. I will now turn it over to Dahlia Lithwick. Thank you so much uh, to Nancy, to John, to the Center for Reproductive Rights, the New York Bar, and the other sponsors. Thank you to all of you. Uh, for, for coming out tonight. Um, I'm going to just tiny housekeeping things. I'm gonna introduce the panelists in a minute. Their introductions are gonna be vastly truncated, uh, only because if I read the totality of their greatness, we would eat up all of our time. Um, uh, if you want to tweet about what you're hearing tonight, hashtag CCR Lawyers Network, uh, and you can tag at Reproductive Rights at NYC Bar Association News. Uh, and for those of you who aren't so hip that you're tweeting, uh, that's okay too. Um, <laughs> The last thing I want to say just as a housekeeping matter is that the Attorney General actually has to leave uh, at 7.30, so he's not going to storm off uh, affronted, but he has another commitment. Uh, so we're going to try to go quickly so that we can get to a little bit of Q&A before uh, he has to go. And, and for the Q&A, we'll bring Nancy back up uh, so she can answer uh, any specific questions directed at her. So without further ado, uh, truncated uh, bio to follow, uh, Eric Schneiderman, the 60 65th Attorney General of New York, uh, really a crusader uh, against corruption for the rights of workers and in this context for the rights of women. Uh, it is an honor to uh, uh, welcome you. Melissa Murray to his left is a professor of law and the director for the Center of Reproductive Rights at Berkeley. Uh, and she's also uh, a prolific writer on uh, women and gender issues in the law. Uh, so I want to uh, welcome both of them and just say how honored I am 
uh, to moderate. And I also want to say, just as a, a personal note, uh, this conversation happens at the red hot epicenter of two of my favorite topics, which are uh, women's rights right now and the fact that lawyers are wizards. And that probably you didn't all know that, but lawyers are wizards. And that's kind of what uh, we're here to talk about. So, so Melissa, I'm going to um, give you the unfortunate task of setting the table for a minute uh, and doing a little uh, four minute romp through all of constitutional reproductive history. Um, <laughs> To the extent that, that we can focus the question, uh, I, I think that what would be super helpful is if you could hone in on this question of what the state of play was before Whole Women's Health and what the state of play uh, is now. Um, I will briefly thank Nancy, John, the City Bar, and the Center for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here, and it's great to see colleagues and students past and present here. So thank you so much for having me. I'm going to resist the professor's conceit of giving you the entire context going all the way back to the 1800s and simply start at 1973, which I think is very restrained. <laughs> um, so in 1973, the court decided Roe versus Wade, which established a woman's constitutional right to terminate her pregnancy. While the court recognized that there is a constitutional right to an abortion, they made clear that it was not unfettered and specifically that the state maintained an interest in regulating abortion in order to secure women's health and for the potentiality of human life. And to balance those two competing interests, the court set out a trimester framework. So under Roe, the first trimester was devoted wholly to the woman. So during the first trimester, the state could not intervene to prescribe or prohibit or restrict abortion. The woman could decide during that period, the first trimester, whether or not um, she wished to terminate her pregnancy. And any state or federal regulation that interfered with that right was presumptively unconstitutional. During the second trimester, the state could intervene to restrict or regulate abortion only to protect the woman's health. And then in the last trimester, when the fetus was considered viable, state laws were then permitted to restrict or proscribe entirely abortion, except where it would be necessary to preserve the health of the mother. Now, Roe was enormously controversial, as you know. Almost immediately, it prompted backlash from all quarters. Um, I should note that in 1976, Congress passed the Hyde Amendment, which is a legislative rider to appropriations bills, which prohibits the use of federal funds to pay for abortion, except where abortion is necessary to save the life of the woman or if the pregnancy arises from incest or rape. And that, of course, has the effect of making abortion access quite um, difficult for women of limited means who depend on public assistance or Medicaid. At the state level, the backlash to Roe versus Wade prompted a series of what are known as trap laws, targeted restrictions on abortion providers that for many years um, did not necessarily seek to overrule the constitutional right to an abortion, but did seek to limit it, to sort of shore off what could be done. And all of this came to a head in 1992 when the court took up a challenge to Pennsylvania's Abortion Control Act and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Many expected Casey to overrule Roe, and many were quite surprised when, in fact, it didn't. Um, but to be clear, Casey changes the landscape considerably. Although Casey affirms the essential holding of Roe, that there is a constitutional right um, to an abortion, it nonetheless jettisons important parts of Roe, including the trimester framework and the standard of review for abortion regulations. Under Casey, the state is free to restrict abortion post-viability so long as there remains an exception for the life and health of the mother. And here's the important change. Before viability, that is in the first trimester and the second trimester, the state can regulate abortions or any point before the point of viability as long as the regulation does not pose an undue burden on women's fundamental right to an abortion. And this undue burden becomes the new standard. So instead of strict scrutiny, which is the traditional standard of review for impositions on fundamental rights, there is a new standard for abortion, the undue burden, which the court defines as any law that has the purpose or effect of placing a substantial obstacle in the path of a woman seeking an abortion before the fetus attains viability. Now, unfortunately, although the Casey Court announces this new standard, it's unclear exactly how it's to be applied or whether the purpose or effect um, predominates or whether both have to be weighed equally. This all changes with Whole Women's Health, which is announced in 2016. 
In Whole Women's Health, Texas, as you know, passed two restrictive abortion regulations, one that required abortion providers to have admitting privileges at local hospitals, and the other that required abortion providers to be outfitted as surgical care centers. The provisions were intended, according to the state of Texas, um, to ensure women's health, but they also, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, had the effect of making it more costly and difficult um, for abortion providers to comply and to provide abortion services, and therefore had the effect of actually shuttering um, a number of abortion clinics throughout Texas. And again, Texas is a quite large state, which has the second largest population of women of reproductive health in the United States. So to shutter abortion clinics across the state is a quite concern enterprise. The case came before the Supreme Court, which invalidated both provisions, finding them both to be an undue burden on the abortion right. And critically, the majority observed that the challenge provisions did not offer medical benefits sufficient to justify the burdens and impositions upon the access that each of the provisions imposed. That is, the purported purpose securing women's health um, wasn't actually secured, and certainly the impositions on access were outweighed by the negligible benefits to women's health. Just as importantly, the majority in Whole Women's Health made clear that the question of whether a law imposed an undue burden was one for judicial consideration. And Nancy alluded to this a little bit when she discussed one of the briefs in the Whole Women's Health case, the idea that the Fifth Circuit in reviewing the abortion provisions had simply deferred to the legislature. The court in Whole Women's Health makes clear that it is an independent duty of the judiciary to review the proffered rationales that legislatures put forth and to ensure that, in fact, the proffered reasons um, are commensurate with the burdens imposed, that courts cannot simply accept these rationales without making their own determinations. Now, to be clear, Nancy described Whole Women's Health as an important victory, and indeed it is an important decision, certainly for the clarity that it provides and the booing effect that it had. But even after this landmark decision, there continue to be attempts, both at the state and federal level, to curb access to reproductive services to women. And I'd be remiss if I didn't note that just yesterday, the House passed a 20-week abortion bill. Um, probably not likely to pass through the Senate, but again, these continue, and this is the third such bill in the last four years. So again, whole women's health is a high watermark, but there are still gains to be made elsewhere. Uh, so Mr. Attorney General, um, I, I read an amazing um, interview with you today in which you said, um, thankfully, at the beginning of my career, they decided Roe, and I thought, whew, that's over. Um, and then that uh, proved to be inaccurate. And, and I want you to speak to the proposition that when Whole Women's Health came down, I think an awful lot of folks in this room said, whew, that's over. Um, but of course, as Melissa just uh, noted, it, it's not over. Can you talk a little bit about what you've witnessed, uh, particularly in New York, in terms of the ongoing uh, assault on reproductive rights? Sure, thank you, um, and thanks for having us here, and John, Nancy, and uh, the City Bar and the Center. Uh, happy to be here talking with you, and I do uh, strongly support Nancy's assertion that lawyers can and should do more, not just uh, in terms of pro bono work, but as advocates and, and changing the tone of the debate in this country, because uh, I actually worked uh, the, the year before Roe v. Wade, I worked in an abortion clinic in Washington, D.C., and that was, uh, I was very, very young, and I thought that that was a, an experience that just would have no relevance to anything in the future. But there was, abortion was legal in the District of Columbia, illegal in the entire Southeast United States, and people were setting up clinics, and women were coming in from Tennessee and Alabama and Georgia. And so I saw what it was like before Roe, and it was horrendous. Uh, and uh, after that, I did, like many people, think that this is not going to be an issue. And uh, I've since learned that you know the fight is really on the ground. And even after Whole Woman's Health, it, the point that uh, uh, about what's going on at the state level and the trap laws, the fact that we have this ac and you know. Uh, acronym for targeted restrictions on abortion providers, that's because there are so many of them. And the Guttmacher Institute just came out with some new statistics last week about the hundreds and hundreds of laws that are enacted at the state level. So I would urge all of you, we tend, a lot of uh, New Yorkers tend to focus very much on what's going on in Washington and what's going on at the Supreme Court. The, the most action right now is at the state level and in all of these efforts that men, 
many of which are in fact upheld as not imposing an undue burden. But the, the recounting of the laws, that uh, these new statistics restricting coverage by private insurance, uh, gestational limits, mandated counseling on the long-term mental health consequences for women having an abortion, that's in, in 13 states, the uh, waiting periods for after parental consent. There are efforts to impose restrictions on women, but also to impose financial burdens on clinics. So in the last uh, five years, uh, 145 out of the, what was once 510 independent clinics across the country have closed down. And they are winning the fight on the ground through all of this work at the state level. Um, the, I think we now are, have eight states that have one clinic for the entire state. So that's what happens when you disengage at the state level. And I think there are a lot of people who don't pay much attention to what their state legislatures do and really should. And in New York, we have not faced those kinds of problems. We've made some progress in recent years requiring um, uh, contraceptive coverage by insurance plans and uh, 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 th that their women are entitled to uh, equal treatment for th their health. Uh, there was a Women's Equality Act that passed about health care, and we've had a clinic access law, which my office enforces to provide buffer zones where you have really violent uh, and intimidating protesters trying to block access to clinics, which does happen in New York. But I want to point out that even in this uh, overwhelmingly pro-choice state, we do not have a pro-choice majority in the New York State Senate. Our abortion uh, rights law, which passed in 1970, is still on the books as essentially an, a, an exception to our homicide statute. It has never been reconciled with Roe v. Wade or with the later jurisprudence. And in the last few years, we've attempted to pass a bill to do that, and it has never been able to pass the New York State Senate. So even in New York, we do have to do our work, uh, not just as lawyers, uh, you know, writing briefs and as advocates, but also do our work politically and make sure that you know what your state legislature is doing. And we should have a pro-choice majority in the New York State Legislature. I don't think there's any question about that, and it's worth paying, paying attention to. Uh, Melissa, Nancy flicked at this in her introduction, but would, would you flesh out a little bit the role that lawyers played in whole women's health because you know the amicus brief that you were involved in so many of them i think had the effect of making women and women's lives really visible uh to the justices in ways that maybe you know when when nine men heard roe uh wasn't uh wasn't visible so i, I nancy and the center um are really we owe a debt of gratitude they not only marshaled enormous resources toward arguing the case, and Stephanie Todi did an amazing job at the Supreme Court, but they also coordinated a phenomenal amicus strategy that was, I, I think, unprecedented and certainly is the model going forward. Um, there were so many different issues that needed to be raised. Often, many of them were raised in the appellants, in the litigants' briefs, but to bring up other side issues that there just wasn't time to bring up in those papers, they really relied on amicus, and they were very, very structured in making sure that each amicus group were covering certain specific issues, not veering into other domains, really fo tightly focused on what they were supposed to do. Um, all of it was coordinated. Uh, the work that I did with my fellow law professors and Dory Tongri, a San Francisco firm, um, we focused specifically on women's dignity and autonomy as it relates to equal citizenship, and we were a piece of a larger strategy. And again, it was sort of like thinking about all of the things that you wanted to present to the Supreme Court and making sure that every one of those amici were speaking separately, but again, in a coordinated and concerted effort to raise those issues. And I mean, it was really a, a quite impressive feat, and so I, I just want to give it up for the center for that. Um, I saw Stephanie Todi last week at um, a moot session for another case that the center is involved in, involving crisis pregnancy centers, and she said that she really relied on other lawyers to do the hard work of mooting her for that case. I mean, so there's another place where lawyers can be helpful. So we have a particular set of skills. This was the first amicus brief I had ever written, and the center held my hand as I wrote it, and I was really grateful for that, but I mean, it really felt amazing to have to say something important um, in that case and to have the result be so fantastic. 
Uh, and Mr. Attorney General, I think you, you talked about this a little bit, but, but more concretely, you know, you've talked about what's happening in the states, but we also have a very different federal landscape right now uh, than we had when Whole Women's uh, Health was decided. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, you know, there are constant, uh, uh, you know, as, as you just heard, there's now a 20-week ban uh, passed in the House. I mean, there's just a constant shifting of the landscape uh, at the highest levels. What, what, what happens in the states when they want to act as kind of a bulwark against those kinds of incursions? Well, this is another area where I'm, I'm a big advocate of, of uh, what's called progressive federalism, of, of using state power uh, to, uh, and engaging at the state level to f both fill in where the federal government retreats from enforcing rights and to fight back when they do things that would hurt the people that we represent. And uh, it, there's really been, I mean, it's as though Washington has just turned into this toxic volcano of bad public policies, and it's just <laughs> constant spewing out of bad ideas in, uh, in many, many areas. And the, uh, uh, there's a coalition of attorneys general that I work with that in the past it was a very casual, hey, you want to sign on to my amicus brief, you know, kind of thing. It was, and after the first week of this presidency, when he dropped his first anti-Muslim travel ban on a Friday afternoon, I was just sitting, at, sitting down, started talking to my counterparts, and by Sunday morning we had 17 states uh, representing more than 130 million people ready to put out a statement that we were going to go into court all over the country and we were going to find some court to block this because it was un-American and unconstitutional. And since that experience, we have been together and we now have, you know, we're having weekly conference calls and we're trying to coordinate a, a, what we can because under our federalist system, if the Congress won't act as a check on an out, out of control executive, we do have this second layer of protection at the state level and the federalist system um, provides a bit of a safety net if we will use our resources and mobilize. And it's been a really interesting challenge, but we've gotten a lot of help from the private bar, from law schools who are sending us law fellows, from uh, uh, activist groups, Center for Constitutional uh, for, for Reproductive Rights has uh, been a great ally of mine for a very long time. And I have to echo what the professor said. I, I mean, I've spent most of my, since I've been doing this since I was 17, most of my time in the pro-choice movement feeling like we're just, uh, you know, getting our clocks clean by the other side and we're really not as well organized and disciplined and we're not doing, we're losing ground every year. Uh, it, that was the best experience I'd had of us feeling like a truly organized, co really well coordinated movement. I mean, not I talked to Nancy well over a year before the, we had to get into court. I talked to the people in the communication side of it about what our communication strategy more than a year before. So, uh, it, and the states, your the point is correct that state attorneys general are in the business of defending bad decisions by state governments. Like that's something we do. You know, we're required to do by law. You don't get just to pick the good laws and say, I'll defend that one, but I don't like the other one. So for us to come into court and say, you know, the, the Fifth Circuit couldn't defer to the findings of a state legislature. I served in the New York State Legislature. You don't want to defer to their findings. It's a, yeah, it really requires, <laughs> requires separate scrutiny. Um, uh, we were able to make that argument. But the, the galvanization of the state attorneys general and other state actors. There, there also are actions being taken by governors, state legislatures. This is a time for real engagement uh, at, at, the, uh, at the state level, and we have had victories. I mean, we have, they keep threatening to defund Planned Parenthood, and we've made it known that we will sue them if they do that. I think there's boilerplate language in every bill they want to pass that's defunding Planned Parenthood. And as they kept trying and failing to repeal the Affordable Care Act, we were faced with that. Um, but we, we are, we are, we have won quite a few victories actually, from the travel bans to beating a former attorney general and world-renowned climate change denier, Scott Pruitt, who now heads the EPA. We've beaten him on a whole host of environmental dial-back efforts. So uh, states can not just uh, uh, serve as uh, places where we, you know, we can make the laws better ourselves and protect people and preserve rights here, we also are very effective, in some cases have a standing that others don't to challenge federal actions, and we are, we are doing that very actively. 
Um, so there are folks walking around with note cards if you've got a question. Um, so please uh, kind of flag somebody. We're going to invite Nancy to come up uh, and answer. We can take a, just a couple questions. But right before we do that, just one last question to, to the two of you, uh, which, is, which is in effect this. I think that what we learned from the travel ban, what I learned, is that uh, lawyers want to be activated. They want to just be told, go to the airport and just open your laptop and hope for the best. And they do, and it was extraordinary. And I'm not entirely sure we're gonna have another moment where lawyers just get to bust out a laptop and help some people, but what is the best advice you can give lawyers, particularly there is, you know, every day, there's some reason to set your hair on fire. And it, sometimes three times a day. So, so I guess I want you to make your best pitch to lawyers about what is the analog for just going to the airport and opening your laptop when it comes to women's rights in America right now? And Nancy, if you wanna come up. Bigger profile. Oh no, I don't know about that. <laughs> um, no, that was an extraordinary experience, particularly for, uh, I'm very proud of being a New York lawyer. Um, and it won't come as a shock to you that around the country we don't have the reputation as the most soft-hearted group in America. So to see these hundreds of lawyers just flocking to the airports to say, I, I, I would just want to help somebody was really extraordinary. But uh, the first thing I would say is do not light your hair on fire. Uh, uh, the, uh, I know the president, have been in litigation with him for many years, uh, and so... Uh, <laughs> And, and I mean, he set up a website to attack me, he sued me for $100 million and filed phony ethics complaints against me. So we've been through it together, um, all of which was dismissed. This was when I sued him over his phony university. But he loves making you want to set your hair on fire. That he, the distraction and the emotional button pushing is a part of his MO. So as lawyers who believe in the rule of reason and the rule of law, uh, I think we can have a calming influence on people. And the most important thing is to keep our eye on on what really is important. And we're not in a situation anymore where it's the traditional conservative to liberal spectrum is really what's defining politics. We are defending the rule of law against people who do not believe in the rule of law. I mean, in this, I'm in litigation now defending the DACA program. I've never in my career been on the same side as the US Chamber of Commerce. I am now. They actually like the DACA program. So lawyers can play a tremendously important role in reminding everybody and through your work and through and through your words and as Nancy says becoming better and more outspoken advocates this is a nation built on the notion of the rule of law and we stand for that it's a time to take pride in being lawyers and our work in the law so I was saying to Dahlia before this started um, progressives are not necessarily made for moments like this we have not been in the wilderness for 40 years we are creatures of comfort um, we're not used to hardship in the way that um, the right is. We have to be ready to be uncomfortable. We have to be ready to sort of figure out how to best engage. Um, maybe it's going to the airport, maybe it's opening up your laptop, maybe it's doing something more quotidian. And again, these issues are rampant and it's not just abortion. I'm really glad that Nancy said that at the beginning, but reproductive rights is not exhausted by abortion. We still have laws that make it an indignity for an incarcerated woman to give birth. We still have laws in many states, including California, that coerce or compel sterilization. I mean, there's lots of work to be done. Find the thing you care most about and figure out how to do something about it, whether it's writing an amicus brief or mooting someone who's about to argue before the court. Whatever it is that you have particular talents, you need to find that and do it. And it may be uncomfortable and it may not be easy and it may not be expedient. But we are privileged to be lawyers. We have a set of skills that very few people have, and we have an obligation to use them. We're wizards, I tell you. Um, so, so um, Attorney General Schneiderman, we have you for two minutes. So I'm going to just ask you the one question uh, that's directed at you, and then I'm going to be mindful that we committed. Take four. OK. Oh. Phew, I'll ask you two questions. Um, it says, uh, Attorney General Schneiderman, you mentioned enforcing clinic access laws. I know you filed a suit against protesters outside Choice Women's Medical Center. Is this a pro common problem in New York? Can you talk about other cases? Sure. We, we've had a problem in New York for the, particularly the last 20 years or so of some very violent uh, groups that protest outside clinics. Uh, we actually have had... Uh, Tragically, uh, about, uh, I guess, 
18, 19 years ago, there was a doctor who was uh, murdered in his kitchen by a sniper, an abortion providing doctor on, outside of Buffalo. And we passed, and in the wake of that, we were able to pass, even through the anti-choice uh, New York State Senate, a clinic protection laws uh, bill that, that I sponsored that, was, um, uh, that made it possible for us to have tar buffer zones, which have been upheld in court, and we've done this in Buffalo, in Utica, uh, all around the state. And it, it depends on the aggressiveness of, of the protesters, but sometimes they physically block women from getting out of their cars, uh, from getting into clinics. They threaten uh, clinic staff and, and doctors. So it has been a problem. We have had a lot of success, though, in the courts enforcing buffer zones and protecting clinics. And as of today, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, we are a state where it is relatively easy to get the reproductive health services to which all women should be entitled, but it is a serious issue and it has been, So, we're, and we're very alert to it. Uh, we have good cooperation with law enforcement, I have to say, across the state about this, so that the sense that uh, these are rights that have to be protected by the government, it's, that's, that's strong throughout the state of New York. Um, Nancy, a question for you. Uh, since uh, the Supreme Court decision in Whole Women's Health, how has the center used that ruling? Uh, what are the implications for cases going forward, and how is the lawyer Lawyers Network going to support that work? Well, so as an initial matter, some other restrictions just fell because they were clearly unconstitutional under Whole Women's Health, so you had Wisconsin and Mississippi and other states. Uh, but we've also used it to attack a whole new a whole new wave of restrictions. We've had to sue Texas twice since winning the whole women's health case against new restrictions, including that you have to bury or cremate embryos and uh, post-abortion or post-miscarriage. Um, but we've also used it to take on long-standing restrictions. So for one example, we have sued the state of Louisiana over their entire abortion licensing scheme, which has 1,000 regulations under it and are making the argument that while licensing may be constitutional, the way that they have applied this is unconstitutional and building from the whole women's health requirements that they must be medically necessary and that we're gonna test those facts uh, in court. So this, the decision about from the Supreme Court, the clarity with the fact that you actually have to have you know, medical evidence that you are advancing women's health and that the courts are gonna decide that has been just absolutely critical in this case and others. Um. Do you have time for one more? All right, I don't wanna get in trouble. Um, it says, for the Attorney General, can you please discuss the movement for states to pass laws requiring coverage of contraception without cost sharing? Why aren't progressive states also pushing for laws requiring coverage of abortion without cost sharing as another essential health benefit? Yeah, this, this is an, an, an area that has come up uh, and gotten new energy since the efforts to repeal the Affordable Care Act, which does provide some protection for contraceptive coverage came up and I actually introduced legislation um, which has not yet passed, but we're gonna try and pass this coming session uh, to ensure free uh, coverage of all forms of contraception and that you know, all insurance has to, has to provide it. I think that honestly we were, our, our level of organizing at the state legislative level just has not been, uh, has not reflected our numbers, has not reflected the strength of our views and the need for progressives to lose the old suspicions of state rights and state sovereignty that's an overhang really from the civil rights era and understand that you can't give up that playing field. You have to engage. You have to uh, uh, do that. These are laws that can be passed at the state level and I think you're going to see a lot of new energy around that now that we're seeing the, uh, the illusion of protection by the federal government fade away because even with a democratic administration, a pro-choice administration, we were losing ground on on the you know the in the actual counties and towns and cities where abortions are being provided. And I'm in keeping with my progressive federalist theme. I do have to go because I'm speaking at an event where New Yorkers are raising money to win seats in the Virginia House of Delegates, which is all up this year. So, thank, <laughs> thank you very you much. We, we can, I think we have time for, for one more quick question, if that's, if that's okay, and, and thank you so much uh, to the Attorney General. Um, can you speak to the Center's partnerships with other progressive organizations around disability rights for Nancy? 
Yes, we've been looking for many years at the issue, both in the United States, but also globally. The Center for Reproductive Rights uh, has an office in Bogota, Nairobi, Kathmandu, Geneva. We work with and partner with organizations around the world and also work at the UN. And the issue of disability rights and the issue of women's, particularly issues around abortion, um, can be seen as being in conflict. And the, those opposed to women's abortion rights have tried to make them in uh, conflict. And issues have come up at the global level with the uh, Disability Rights Convention. And, and it gets raised in the United States um, when sometimes people want to say, well, only certain uh, fetal conditions should be the basis for termination. And we've always taken the strong position that we don't uh, ever advocate for laws that particular fetal conditions should be the basis of termination for pregnancy. Um, those are decisions for families to make, for individuals to make, and we support the rights of the disabled both for their own reproductive rights and to have the uh, dignity and equality and uh, the notions whether, you know, prenatal or not about um, uh, people with disabilities. So we have worked over the years. We've done, you know, uh, statements of, of um, principle around this, as I say, both in the U.S. and globally. Uh, I think I'm going to thank Nancy Northup and Melissa Murray and all of you for being here. I have a couple more questions, but you should just pin them down at the bar over there. Um, I really want to thank uh, the center, the Bar Association, the Attorney General, and, and really all of you for making time. This is uh, now more than ever something that we have to uh, really, really not let ourselves go on screensave over these issues. They are as urgent as they've ever been. Thank you very much. Yeah.